you know, running a small, running a small business is not, not easy and it's not for the faint of heart. And especially then when you get somebody else that uh, starts living with you and, and you have to take care of to some degree, um, it, it just makes you make decisions that you should and think around things that you should. So at the end of it, we were pretty much to the point of shutting it down to where it was just a one man. It was, it ended up just being me at the end. We had shut everything down. And then again, talking about series of a series of luck or, or blessings along the way. You know, my wife said, yeah, you should, we just need to get, you just need to do something to generate um, some reliable income. Hello and welcome to the Leaders in Tech podcast. Uh, I am your host, David Mancella. As everybody knows, uh, this uh, podcast is shining the lights on leaders in technology that are responsible for empowering their teams and their companies to raise the bar in these uh, times that seems to be troubled. Uh, so I love to interview leaders in technology that are creating technology that are making this world a better place. And one of the great examples of those leaders is my guest today, Jeremy. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, David. I uh, appreciate that. I'm not sure if I can live up to that, but that's great. Jeremy, uh, for the audience, can you give me uh, your full name? Where do you live and uh, where are you working at right now? Sure. Uh, my name is Jeremy Tilth. I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in the United States, and I currently work for SpendMend, which is a, um, we're a healthcare servicing uh, company that uh, tries to get back any any cost savings that's possible. So we're, we're serving the healthcare industry, but not from the patient side, more from the back office side. That's beautiful. And what do you do for them, uh, Jeremy? I'm the chief technology officer, and I also wear the chief information officer as well. So external and internal products. That's, that's amazing. All right, so tell me, how are you changing the world with your job? What, <laughs> what is it that you are passionate about what you're doing right now? Uh, how am I changing the world? So. Uh, hopefully we're changing the world. Our, our mission is to reduce the cost of healthcare. So uh, I believe in that. I believe what we do um, through cost savings and through just general financial responsibility or enabling financial responsibility should be passed down to the to the patients. So that's that's our working goal is to improve healthcare and reduce costs that hopefully goes down to the consumer side. Um, as far as how we are getting there now and the things that are exciting uh, that we're doing, you know, we, we work a lot in automation. So from our team, we have a fairly small uh, company. We're about 350 employees or so. Um, and so for the amount of hospitals that we service, I think we have a fairly uh, small team. Our IT team is about 30, so 10% or so, or a little bit less of the company. And, uh, you know, we really work a lot in automation so we have tried to take as many manual steps uh, as possible and automate those. It's, as you know, the, the environment right now is very, uh, very uh, exciting as it comes to with uh, generative AI and things uh, of the AI nature. So we're investing in that heavily and trying to, um, you know, responsibly do as much as we can to not only drive down the customer cost, uh, but also reduce our internal labor costs. It's incredible, Jeremy, but you're completely right. Like uh, people people are only getting to know AI since last year, since ChatGPT became popular, but uh, the concept of AI was from back from the 60s yeah. uh, when we had nothing, but people were already imagining that we can create artificial intelligence. Um, and I am amazed because I've been in technology since 1985, 1986. I, I learned how to how to code uh, when I was 16 years old. And when I realized what an if statement was, a case statement, it's basically typing, it's typing intelligence into an algorithm. But that was so rudimentary and basic. Now, the difference is that machine learning can type those if statements by itself. Yeah. So it can actually code itself, which is for me, when, when I, you know, I've been monitoring this because again, one of my main companies is a custom software solutions business. So we need to be in the leading edge of the technology to provide better and, and cheaper services to our clients. So in, in what are similar, the difference is that you do it for healthcare, which has a lot more novelty, 
And we do it for every client that comes into us, which by the way, half of our clients are healthcare, uh, hospitals and you know all kinds of different com companies, um, laboratories, for example. But my amazement is the advancement of AI. Like I knew it was exponential, but your brain cannot really comprehend what exponentiality is. Um, there is a saying that, that the understanding the exponential uh, way of things is man's greatest gift. Because when you realize that there is a hockey curves, curve growth in some patterns in the world, mm -hmm. uh, you can take advantage of that. Computer technology is one of them, and specifically AI. And uh, But the problem with the hockey stick is that at the beginning, it looks like you're not making any progress. Mm -hmm. It's a long horizontal road, but when it starts exponentiating and you can see it, it goes all the way up very fast. Yeah. To give you an idea, last year, 40% of the code that my developers wrote was done by AI. 40% wow. of them. Wow. Think about that. Like, it's incredible. And I that, and that's why you are actually getting more, more benefits, right? Because if you're utilizing uh, AI, your cost is getting lower, which means your client cost will get lower, right? Yeah. And I think it really, for, for us at least, um, the value of AI currently is in that writing the code, also providing, um, it, we, we seem to be getting the most value as it comes to the development side from testing. Uh, you know, being able to write that test code, it's very, mm -hmm. it's much more efficient to be able to write code in one of many ways and then throw that code at, at an AI uh, bot that will generate the tests to support that and test right. data generation, things like that. Um, the thing I think that is so interesting about the AI movement right now in software development is that you can't, you still have to know what you want. So the, the bots and the agents, they can write the code, but you need to know what you want and you need to be able to articulate it to a degree, not as much as you used to have to articulate, but you still have to articulate what you want. And so from me, myself, I haven't written code in you know several years production code for sure play around code uh yeah but it has really enabled me because i'm i'm sitting with the the vision of the company and i can start writing code just because i can articulate what i really want and then i can pass it down to uh an architect that might that doesn't have the full full picture and they can come up with you know the five or six things that I clearly missed because I'm not you know I'm not at their level and then uh, you know go even further than that and by the time you get down to it you know we we have all high level coders but you know you just can't expect somebody that's a senior level developer to have the business context to know the problem and that's really the hardest part is that you you can't articulate the problem down through the chain. So uh, I'm very excited as we get further advancements in AI where they start getting, you know, call it, quote unquote smarter, you know, to where they can then articulate some of the problems or, or come up with the, the problems around it. Because writing the code seems to be, you know, it's not a solved problem, but it's very, it's very close to a solved problem at this point. The, the way I see it, Jeremy, is that um, when I went to computer science, what I what they taught me was how to research and how to think, how to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Because once you know how to ask questions and how to research, you become a very good engineer. And what AI is doing is giving you a platform infinite better than any search engine could have ever given you in the past. I truly believe that if Google doesn't step up with their AI system, like they're going to be left behind because people are not going to use Google anymore. Mm -hmm. When you can ask an AI to give you all the research and it will give you actually a paper yes. that yeah. you can validate. I mean, yeah. that's where we are, right? You know, I, I'm a born again Christian, so you know, I, I have a channel for for my faith. And sometimes I need to I need to figure out and research some passages from the Bible. And uh and I was doing it manually. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to ask my bot to see what it, it comes, comes up with. And I'm very specific because I know how to ask questions. 
And what, what comes back to me, I validated with my scriptures and it's a hundred percent accurate. And, I, and it's explained in a way that I, I couldn't like, like a preacher will explain it. And I, I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously you have to be very careful because with AI, you have to have the intelligence. Like for example, going back to development, right? You cannot, still you cannot tell an AI, you know, solve this problem for me and write code for it. We're not there yet, but we're almost there. Right. But, but for example, a specific objects, they can be written by AI. Write an object with these parameters, with these interfaces, da, 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 and it will actually write it for you. That's why you right. can do automated testing now. You say, do the automated test for this code, and it will, because it knows the parameters, it will spit it out in seconds. You know how yeah. much time people wasted writing test code? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And now there's no, there's less excuse because that was always the trailing metric, right? Is how much code. What's your code coverage by tests? And so, you know, tests are, unless you're very disciplined, tests are always the last thing you think about um, in getting to that very mature level of, of development. So I'm, sure. I, we love it. And, uh, you know, hopefully just using it more and more. Obviously we're just like everybody else. This is very new. It's new for everybody. It's all happened within the last 18 months really. So, um, you know, I won't feign any level of maturity with it, but luckily we we did, invest some money and you know grabbed a group of people to as soon as it started being something that we could not ignore responsibly you know see see what we could do and put some spike solutions and some proofs of concept out there uh, and then hopefully within this next year we though as those proof of concept uh, start to get to where we're using them in production now we can take it to the next level take it to the rest of the service lines and say hey here's what we're doing here Let's see how we can take care of it uh, in other areas. So I really think, I really think that our use is going to ex uh, explode, and you know, along with the rest of the world, as people create more of these, uh, more of the tools. I feel the tools, the tools are the are the big things that are growing right now, at least from what I for I hear of people b building these custom, purpose driven bots that then they're selling as tools to the developers. Uh, so yeah. So, Shifting from the cutting edge technology of getting everything, the LLMs created and trained to now building on top of those LLMs as the next market that'll explode. Like, like it happens all the time in technology, right? Like you start with this uh, leading edge stuff and then it becomes uh, a commodity where you can just operate within them and just use them as on your daily on your daily activities. The one word of advice that I will give uh, Jeremy is that AI is just as good as the data that is using. And if there is big companies are blocking data for any reason, could be political or it could be any point of view, if they are on purpose are filtering out the data before it gives you the result, you need to be careful because you might have uh, information that is not complete, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that's my point is you still need engineers. You still need humans that know what the problem is and how to ask. To, to be solved and then you need people that need to check that whatever you're getting automated is correct yes right? yeah <laughs> jeremy how do you make it to be becoming a a a, a top uh, tech leader in such a short time uh, how, how do you get going let's let's step back into university did you go to school for computer science uh i went to school for that was my minor so i had business business administration and computer science was my degree um, and you say a short time, but it's really not been a, it's not been a short time for me. Uh, so I was, uh, I started school in, uh, 96. So, and I'd have been in the workforce full time in some technical role since 2000. Since so, 2000. Yep. Yeah. What but, was your uh, first job? That, like uh, you wanted to do like more analytics or you wanted to do more coding or what was your, sure your passion? Yeah, so the first job, uh, first job out of school was actually an internship, uh, my sophomore year in college, and um, it was an IT, just a, uh, IT manager for a, a manufacturing company, and it was great because I came in as the only IT person uh, in the company, and really they just wanted somebody to run help desk and and things like that. So this was this was back back in the day. So we were on a uh, Novell network. Um, you know, so I say, hey, let's, let's shift over to NT three, five. And so we, we did that and they were very supportive of doing that and then implemented a 
ERP system. On top of that, implemented remote desktop with Citrix. Uh, and then got to the point of where I was ready to go on to something else. And I had been writing some software for them to, to do uh, factory management, uh, work management. We, we created belts for treadmills and other industrial operations. And so there was no, it was all human planning. So was working on, on uh, software that built, uh, planned out where you could, should cut belt out of waste material to not, to not uh, just keep cutting new rolls of, of materials. Uh, and go back and utilize all that uh, material as, as best you can. And I ended up just leaving and then said, hey, would you guys like to be my first customer? I'd want to start a start a development company. And so that's... Oh, so you started your own business too? Yep, I did. That was in 2002 uh, or three, I think. And uh, so did that. They I came with my only customer. That was an incredible blessing uh, because, you know, starting starting with nothing is very hard. And at least if you have somebody that keeps the lights on, you know, in the home office, then it lets you make very it very hard. Work. That's <laughs> yeah. So that was very, I was very lucky to get that. Um, all of this is just I, everything that's got me where do I, where I am now has just been a series of luck, uh, you know, and I see, I see, I see, a series of blessings, right? Like journey. Yes. What yeah. made you living in a country where software development is such a beautiful career where people, businesses fight for coders. What was in your mind? Why would you want to open your own software company? Uh, well, so in that time, it was the, it was before the .NET crash or, you know, it, it was all before then. So we were making websites and you could make good money making websites. And uh, so we were doing that and branding. So corporate branding and, uh, and websites was the was where I started out. So being a third or being your own company was actually decent for, for a little while until, until the Dreamweavers and, um, you know, I forget Microsoft front page and, and even then GoDaddy and all the, the make your own website tools came along and kind of ruined the party for everybody that was uh, honestly charging a lot of money for doing, you know, what's not very difficult to do. Uh, right. So, uh, but that's called knowledge, right? Fun. That's why people make a lot of money. When you right. can do in five minutes what somebody may take three months, even if it's easy for the one that does it in five minutes, that costs a lot of money because you're yeah. saving time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's the same thing where the coding is the the coding is the commodity, but having the vision for what you want and being able to translate between, you know, a customer or a brand and then an execution of, of some some functionality with software uh, I, I think was key because it's always for my journey i've always been able to have the customer the direct contact with the customer and also the direct contact with the code and so in a bigger organization i'm very glad that i didn't go to a large organization and start at as a level one coder you know and and work up so i think that would have been possible but I'm very, obviously, I'm very glad for the trajectory that everything has had for uh, for me. But being, getting that in a way, not, you know, full stack, always in front of the customer, directly to behind the keyboard for so many years has been incredibly helpful at my uh, place right now. Because you consistently have to get voice of customer. And yeah. that's a very easy thing to lose track of if and you're you know, not for, disciplined. You know, Jeremy, it's beautiful because both things work. And that's that's why I love the free world. And you and I have the blessing to still live in a free society where we have, you know, a free economy. I want to tell you why. And this is very important for the listeners. Listen to these people. Corporations help to train great entrepreneurs, especially in technology. That's the path that I took actually. But also, listen to this, also businesses and entrepreneurs is a great way to get trained for corporations. Mm -hmm. They are, it's incredible. It's, it's like 
the ecosystem, you know, and that's why I'm a man of faith. You know, in the economy, you, you have a major in business. In the economy, we call it the invisible, the invisible financial hand. There is a hand that nobody sees that controls the economy if you let it run free. And you, you only have to look at the world to, to see that that's what works. If you go to a communist country like Cuba or Venezuela or North Korea, they control everything. The government controls the economy and they are horrible, horrible, broken countries. When you have a country like Canada or the States, when most of the economy is free, the country thrives and, and goes. And, and why? Because it's this invisible hand that is providing for one another and allowing you to choose whatever you want. You want to be slacking off and you don't want to pro right. progress in your life, you are allowed to do that. Okay. You really want to move forward, to you progress, you're really willing to learn, you can also do that too. Yep. Isn't that amazing? It is. <laughs> it is. And your your limits keep getting stretched within within a given time frame. So the technology the advancements in technology make the possibilities so much greater in the same amount of time. So I'm, I'm very, uh, man, I'm somewhat envious when I start thinking of, of somebody, if, if I was 25 years younger right now, coming into, coming into this environment without, um, you know, without having gotten to the place of, uh, you know, family, the kids, the things that you want, you want to get to there for sure. But it doesn't mean you can put in those 65 hour weeks on a consistent basis anymore. And when you're, when you're young and super hungry, you know, and that's just all you think about doing is coming home from the day job and, and then, you know, picking up the keyboard and, and start playing around for fun. And so I, I do get a little reminiscent and, and uh, you know, minorly jealous of, of these new kids coming in to the, but uh, yeah, I'm really excited for, for the possibilities and you're absolutely right it's just there's no there's no limits there are no limits on what uh i mean this the the thing that we're talking about with gen I, gen ai was not even it was a pipe dream you know five years five years ago and then all the way back to the 60s like you said it's always been a pipe dream and it's not been achieved the the uh general intelligence but Man, it, it's it's very likely that something very close to that happens in the next in the next uh, you know seven years for sure. Uh, and you know what, uh, Jeremy, um, I agree with you and kids with this new technology being born into this new technology. But I also think that you and I have a blessing. By the way, I thought you were a lot younger. Now I get it. It took a, it took a while too. <laughs> All right, I'll you take that have as a, a blessing. compliment. I'll take that as a compliment. Right? We we saw the birth of the internet. We saw the implementation of cell phones. We saw the exponentiality of technology, Jeremy. They didn't get to see that. Mm -hmm. That's true. You went through Blackberries, right? You went through Pagers, oh, yeah. Blackberries, iPhones, right? These yep. kids didn't see that. Yep. Did you ever code it in a text-based editor, like with, you know, with like without a, a graphical user interface? Of course, yeah, of course. Commodore. Right, yeah. me too. Yeah. And, but but, it, but the technology grew so fast in the last 30 years that we're still enjoying the latest and greatest, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think you can be. Uh, I'm much more. I'm much more amazed at the technology because I know how hard. I know how it hard is. it is. So even yeah. something as simple as a video game. My son plays lots of video games, and every game is. Uh, you know, he's playing real time with people from across the world. And it, I mean, that's been the norm for, for many, many years, but it still blows my mind that you can have a conversation going with somebody. That's, that's fine. We've been having conversations across the world for plenty of years, but you know, one, one thing that you do with a controller is instantly, instantly uh, across the world to somebody else. And you're actually playing a real time game with real-time response rates, it is, it is just, I mean, the technological, the infrastructure for communication is amazing. And the computing, the, the, the ways that we have done to simplify that traffic, to get a message small enough 
to uh, to get across those wires in that time and then still be like watching a movie. You're you're playing a movie in these games. It is it just blows my mind. So I I do love it. You're you're right. I, I love knowing where we come from. I can't wait to you know see hopefully as much as I can, but my ten year old when he gets to be forty seven, you know, I hope he has the same amount of wonderment about whatever whatever advances have happened in that in that uh meantime, which I, I only assume are gonna be incredible. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you with your age. I'm going to you no. together. It took me the same time. <laughs> You're never going to offend were, me. Honestly, you look like you were like 35 years old. And then ah, once okay. we start talking, I'm yeah. like, oh, no, he's, you know, he's seen the stuff that I've seen. You know, I ah, thought, yeah. I, you know, I started writing code that, you know, at, at 16 years old and I'm 52 now and, and I'm still learning. That's why I have this podcast. The first person that learns is me. Yeah. <laughs> you see? That's great. That's great. Uh, Jeremy, how long how long did you have your business for? Uh, so I was in business by myself for about um, I think about five years, and it wasn't by myself. I had I had two other partners uh, in there, and so I think it was five years or so. And like I said, it was right there at the end um, where it got very obvious, and I got married uh, right at the end. And yeah. You know, running a small running a small business is not not easy, and it's not for the faint of heart. And especially then when you get somebody else that uh, starts living with you, and and you have to take care of to some degree, um, it, it just makes you make decisions that you should and think around things that you should. So at the end of it, we were pretty much to the point of shutting it down, to where it was just a one man. It was it ended up just being me at the end. We had shut everything down, and then again talking about series of. A series of luck or, or blessings along the way you know my wife said yeah you should we just need to get you just need to do something to generate um, some reliable income so I interviewed for a tech support a part-time tech support job and I came in for the interview and talked to them and they said you know you got you're probably way overqualified for a tech support level one and I said that's fine I don't I'm not trying. I just need a. I just need something to get me a paycheck so that I can do what I'm really passionate about, which is writing code and running running this business. You know, so uh, so they didn't offer me a tech support job. They they offered me instead. They said, "Hey, we have this division that's not quite not quite started up, but we think that you would actually be really good to to run this." And um, it was a it was a automation division. So we would automate the back office for, for hospitals. Sounds a lot like what I'm doing now because it's still the same, still the same company now, but three iterations of ownership later. Wow. So That's that, amazing. Was, that was back at the beginning, just a chance, you know, go get, go get a side job so that you can, don't have to deliver pizza at night. Uh, and that turned into a full-time job from the day one. And then from there, again, the, the people that the people that ran the company were just top notch and just standout uh, guys. And so because I came in young and even then, so I probably looked a little younger than what I should have. Hopefully that's the case for as long as I live. But so I came in and they called me Jimmy Neutron. Uh, so I kind of took it as an offense a little bit, but it was nice because it's one thing when you're 27 years old to get called a kid versus when you're 47 years old to get called a kid. Right. It's, uh, it's two different <laughs> feelings. But uh, so that, that really, it's the same people, the same people that I met on day one. Um, one of the three owners of that company is the CEO of SpendMend now. And so he is, I've gone to two other companies in the meantime. Uh, he has two, and then it's all come back around. So, you know, I'd say to the, to your listeners as well, do not burn your bridges um any any time especially yeah. if you meet good people along the way because the now that I'm now that I'm hiring instead of trying to get hired and and consistently growing you you find the people that you worked well with and that you respected and that you know have a great work ethic and you do keep bringing them back around so yeah. i i have i have hired the same one guy um you know i've gone in back and got him I think once or twice, uh, 
maybe twice, I, I believe. And because he's an excellent guy and anywhere I go, I want to have him on my team. So it's a, it, that work ethic, work ethic uh, matters a lot. Even if you don't like the job, people see it because other, because people move around, leaders move mm -hmm. around and that leader might not like the, the company that you're with either. And they might move to something great and say, you know, that person was really good and I could trust them with a problem and not have to worry about it getting done. So I'm going to bring them into this next endeavor. But if you, if you, you know, have a negative event or, you know, decide to do anything um, that could end up burning that bridge that you might burn the bridge, not just with the company, but with all those people that are going to be moving just like you are. So, yeah, I mean, what this advice that you just gave made this podcast incredibly important is, you know what? I've been doing this podcast since February last year, and I've interviewed people of, you know, with multi-billion dollar responsibilities, like, you know, like CIOs with like, like global CIOs. And every podcast is beautiful and amazing, but nobody has taken this, this advice yet. And I, something that I know in my heart that I've been forgetting to bring out. And it's so funny because yesterday I heard a story from a, um, my, my brother-in-law. He told me this story that impacted me so much that goes exactly with what you say. He was working for Abbott, this, this large multinational, um, but he was being bullied and, and people were very jealous of him. But he always kept a professionalism that was unexpected, especially in that environment. He always respected people. Later on in this in this job, his boss, that was a mean boss, got hired by another company. And then he took him in and he says, you know, that this company hired me, they doubled my salary. And they asked me if I had somebody that could work uh, for me to accelerate this process. And I told them, if you want my advice, I can give you one person, but you are not allowed to give them job interviews. You have to hire them right away because if you're asking me, it's because you're trusting me. And then they say yes. And then he says, he goes back to my brother and he says, and that person is you. You want to come work for me? And he doubled his salary and his work environment got much better. And they became close friends. Yeah. But what would have happened if, if he would have acted poorly and or maybe tried to get back to the people that were doing wrong to him or talking behind his back? he would have borne that bridge. Right. <laughs> and that was a pivotal point in his, in his career. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. there's right. so much movement. It, you can't, it, you know, especially with uh, the current, the generations, or I'd say the last two generations, it's not, they're not like, I was, I was brought up in just the tail end where everybody got the job and then they stayed there. So I happen to not like, I don't like to move around a lot just because it seems like a hassle to me. So, uh, mm -hmm. but I've again been very blessed in landing at places that I like to work. So I don't consider work work very much. I, I really enjoy doing it. It's what gets me up in the morning. So that just happened to work out great for me. Um, but, you know, it's almost at this point in time, you almost have to be moving jobs on some kind of regular cadence if, especially yeah. if you're young because there's no other really good way to increase your salary up to, yeah. and it's just the reality of of it you'll you're always going to make more as you as you go uh, from job to job unless you have somebody that wants to treat you responsibly and and well and keep you around and i would totally believe in that and hope that uh i hope that everybody does but for the most part, uh, that's it. So it's even more important because everybody is moving so much more. You don't get stuck with the same person or the same company for 25 years uh, very often at all. Incredible, but it's true. And to, to start with, most businesses go bankrupt within two years. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. Right? That's Especially to start with. Startup and then, tech community, yeah. And then there is so much instability in the market today that you're right, right? It's, it's just imagine COVID, right? During COVID, I lost 40% of my revenue in one month. Jeez. But then by September, I couldn't hire people. Mm -hmm. So I grew so much that I was hiring more and there were no people available. 
Right. So it's such a weird instability, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that sounds like that was a, that was a positive shift or did you caught with, or did you get caught where you had decreased revenues and you needed to hire people, but then there, the, the, the prices you had to pay for that same talent during COVID were incredibly inflated from, from pre COVID. So you I were, know. that was a net positive for you all the way around though. Exactly, Jeremy, and you, you experienced it because you hired people, right? And, you know, but you know what struck me? I was in Miami uh, a year later, like 2021, and uh, I was waiting for my flight at the airport, and I went to get a coffee at Starbucks and inside the airport, and it was a two-block line, mm -hmm. like 200 meter line of people. So when I found it, I had like five hours, so I, I made the line anyway, but when, when I got there, Two ladies were sweating, like, and I, I asked the, the, one of the ladies, like, why you have guys do, doesn't have, why don't you have any staff? You know what she said? Nobody wants to work right. because the government is giving money to the people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What a shame, eh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it is, it is a shame. I don't know how, I think we're still waiting to see how that all plays out in long term. Yeah. So it seems like inflation inflation now, right? Out. The result is inflation, right? The result is inflation, but I don't see right. as many people that don't want to work anymore. I, no. I feel like that's yeah. definitely, you know, you stop giving out the stimulus, stimulus, stimulus checks, whatever that word is. Um, and, and people naturally decide they, they want to get back to work. It's not as fun. And, and then it is fun. It is fun to work uh, for, for most people. Uh, even the people at Starbucks, I've never, I haven't met too many of them that are, they enjoy, they enjoy it for the most part. Right. Um, in general. So I think, I think if given the opportunity, people will leave their couches and they will work eventually because it's all, everybody knows it is fun to watch TV and play games for a while. And then your natural, yeah. your natural instincts to go and create and go and do and work are going to kick in and i think that we're pretty much there i don't i don't have a lot of negative feeling about the current generations or or the the current workforce being slackers and i hear people say that and stuff i don't actually think that's true but you're actually absolutely right i think we are past that because yeah. i can see it in my hiring right with all the businesses that i run like people are back back on making interviews and they are excited they want to learn they want to change we we'll go back to the faith thing right like we are we brought to, we brought to this world to do something, not to watch TV or play video games. I mean, that's fun for a little bit, mm -hmm. but you need to interact with people and you need to co-create. You need to, you need to feel that your life matters, doesn't it? When, once, like this is the syndrome of many people that are born rich, and their parents don't force them to work. These kids, they become drug addicts and they become, you know, they become a mess because they don't have any meaning in life, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with you. Uh, and again, I think uh, our business, software development, is uh, you know, person by person. You, you, everyone likes what they like, but I can't say enough good things about the, the craft of software development yeah. and just the opportunity to take... All you need is a computer, which is pretty much nothing at this point. Most people have them or you can get them for almost nothing. And even if it has no power, you can get onto Google's collab lab and you can code on someone else's hardware if you want in the cloud. You can write whatever you want to do. There's zero, there's zero limitations on you. You have, yeah. you have the most powerful resources to run any level of code within your house uh, amazing and amazing there's no there's no material cost you know you're just limited by your imagination and your ability to you know translate that imagination down into code and you have all these tools now to help you get that from point a to point b so it's it's a limitless it's just a limitless uh endeavor i feel like writing code is is the ultimate creativity playground and you know, talking about blessings too, Jeremy, I fell in love with computer science when I was 16 years old and uh, specifically software development and software architecture. And I fell into this community of coders, this global community of coders, and uh, we're different. 
aren't we? We're different from the rest. I haven't seen a community of, of, of business that help each other so much unconditionally. You know, when I got my first job as a coder, I needed to learn a lot. You know, you know, after university, you, you just pretty much are a, a blank state, right? And I remember back then in the 90s, downloading news groups and asking questions on news groups and people from all over the world helping me fixing a bug. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't stopped. Yeah. You have all these communities helping each other out, sharing code or, you know, this bug in this compiler is like this and try that and unconditionally, unconditional yeah. love. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's and, amazing. And look at the reason, the reason we can go to ChatGPT or Bard or any of the other and ask it to write some code for you is because you and I, and hundreds and thousands of other peoples were on Stack Overflow for the last 20 years, yep. sharing code, yep. right? Just sharing code. So the fact that we were doing that for so long and the problem is written out right above the solution, that that is now what, it's almost like a gift to the current generation of saying, we all struggled through it and had these conversations with each other. It wasn't really too much of a struggle. Like you said, people were there to help but now we create this next tool because of all of that data being available. Because without, if no one would have shared, then there would be no, you, you can't start with general intelligence. You have to make the steps that we're making now. And it's brilliant, Jeremy, because actually ChatGPT and any bot will actually go and, and mine that data and it will understand yeah. how to solve the problem and then just mimic it. Yep. That's how AI works now, yep. right? Now, after these layers and layers, it's going to start doing stuff by itself. But it's true. Without Stack Overflow, without sharing knowledge online, we wouldn't have AI. <laughs> no. Isn't that amazing? No, it is. <laughs> it is. And that's the thing. There's consequences to everything. And just in the general nature of being a good person, a yeah. collaborative person, like nobody really thought that that's the way it would happen. You know, you were just trying to solve a problem with a bunch of like-minded people and everybody had a, you know, very communal sense to it. And so now we're here now, but there is a little bit of sadness to it because I don't post a question on Stack Overflow anymore. Right. Right. So maybe there's the, that the ramp of right? is going down because now you're interacting with these, with these chat bots. Yeah. So. I mean, that has its consequences too, but we're finding other ways of being, uh, you know, collaborating. Yeah, and being human, right? That, that's, yes. the, that's the, and you know what, you're right. That's that's one of the problems that I see coming forward. Uh, COVID didn't help for people to become social. They, they became more isolated. Mm -hmm. And now you have all these tools that, that have no people behind them and you're interacting with them. Just look at what we're doing. It's a blessing. You're somewhere in the States, I'm over here. We're having this live conversation and it's beautiful, but wouldn't it be better for you to come to a studio and have coffee with me and maybe go for lunch afterwards? Sure. That would have sure. been better. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but <laughs> that would be a gate that, you know, it probably wouldn't happen. So exactly. you get to you get to have something happen, but maybe not happen as pure or as, you know, great as it could have been, but you get way more, way more connections, maybe not to the same level. Right. And, and that's what I would encourage people that are listening to us, especially if you're a coder, an architect. There is communities out there. Belong to a community. Go to have, you know, I remember uh, there is something called Society for Information Management. They, they meet once a month. And you go there and hang out with other architects, with other people, other leaders in technology, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, you know, 50 minutes went by already. <laughs> oh, wow. Really? <laughs> Yeah, I good. said that's it was going to be 45. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to respect your time. Jared. Do you have anything no else to say? No, I think this is great. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Keep doing good. I watched uh, the other videos. There, Everything's great. I I like it. I'll follow you from now on. Thank you so much, Jeremy. One last question before we finish the podcast. Mm -hmm. If you had access to a billboard in front of the busiest highway on earth, what would you write in it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh -huh. You know, um, I don't know what it would write, but it would be something, something to the degree of, uh, look down and not just because the eyes are off the road, but just 
to don't lose track of where you are right now. I know my dad used to always tell me wherever you are, be there or be all there. And I think that there's a lot, you know, the, the initial, the zone right around you seems to be very neglected. So I, as I get older and the more, I, the awareness, I feel like people are losing their immediate, immediate awareness and they might be, they're looking too far or looking maybe digitally, like we said, every other, all life is lived in digital and not around them, or they're just uh, always thinking about work. I fall into that trap a lot where you don't treat your weekends as what they should be um, or your evenings, what they should be. And you just get caught up. And so I, it's something to the degree of, you know, slow down, look around you, you know, touch something that's physical, go do something uh, that mean that, that actually touches you, you know, physically almost. Yeah. Be that's a beautiful advice. Jeremy, thank you so much. God bless you, brother. If people like to ask more questions, are you on LinkedIn? Uh, I am. You can just look for Jeremy Toth on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Let me thank you so much. God bless. Right. And have a beautiful rest of the week. Thank you. You too. Blessings. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for tuning in to the Leaders in Tech podcast. Check in next week to keep learning how to use technology and leadership to change the game. See you next time.